Okay, great. So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's SEDS Online webinar. We're really happy to have you. And my name is Chelsea Pedersen, and I'm going to be your host today. And we have a really great speaker, so I'm excited about that. Um, before we get started, we would like to thank our sponsor, the IAS, who is um, really just enables us to provide everything free of charge to all of you. Make sure and check out everything we have to offer on the website. Um, the different webinar recordings, the great debates, all of those sorts of things are up there and on our YouTube channel. So make sure and check it out. Uh, today's lecture is by Dr. Gregor Eberly. He's a professor at the University of Miami Rosa Steel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. And Gregor received his master's and his PhD from ETH Zurich before he headed over to University of Miami to work with um, the late Bob Ginsberg within the realm of carbonate sedimentology. Gregor became a professor at the University of Miami in 1991 and has been teaching there ever since. He is now the endowed chair, um, the Bob Ginsburg Endowed Chair of Marine Geosciences. So that's, that's quite cool. And um, congratulations on that, Gregor. And he's also the director of CSL, the Center of Carbonate Research. His research focuses on carbonate sedimentology and sequence stratigraphy. And we're really happy to have him as our speaker today at SEDS Online uh, to talk about everything about carbonate platforms. And with that, Gregor, thank you again, and I will give you the mic. Thank you, Chelsea, for that very nice introduction. Hello, everybody. So I want to bring you to the Bahamas, and the, the title of my talk is like Facing Forces That Shape the Incredible Steep Slope of Carbonate Platforms. When we go to the textbooks, we always have the morphology of carbonate platforms in the ramp or in shelf and isolated platforms and sort of to give a nice picture of the phases distribution in there. I think what they don't convey is how high and steep these individual platforms can be. And that's what I want to show you today. Also the processes that work on these very steep um, slopes and coming off the platform that shape then the four the different architectures of the slope. So for that, I want to of course go where I, close by, Hi, Miami is right here, and we are in the middle of a carbonate province from the Yucatan shelf over the West Florida ramp to the Bahamian archipelago. All these large carbonate provinces here, and you see everything in dark red is less than 200 meters. Actually, a lot of it is, especially in the Bahamian archipelago, is less than 10 meters. And you see that the West Florida shelf or ramp, it goes out and it steepens a little bit and then breaks down into the Gulf of Mexico, or on the other side, we come here from Little Bahama Bank, we go out into the Abaco Canyon and go right down in the very deep Atlantic Ocean. I want to show you these two transects to show how steep and how high these carbonate platforms here, the West Florida ramp or shelf is in this portion here. You see the Florida shelf goes out to about 400 meters with a distal ramp, so it's slowly sinking down and then it steepens into the slope and then breaks down into the escarpment into the Gulf of Mexico. And this, when it breaks down at the end, it goes from about 1800 to 3000 meters, sometimes near vertical into the abyss there, into the Gulf of Mexico, and is on lap by siliciclastic sediments that fill the Gulf of Mexico. If we go to the other side, onto the Florida side, out to the Atlantic, we have here Little Bahama Bank, this was a, a DM that was put together by Thierry Mulder and his group. And uh, Mrs. Recouvreur had published this in a wonderful article where you see Little Bahama Bank, the slope canyons, they go down to the Blake Plateau, the Abaco Canyon, and then it goes down into the Blake Basin. And just the last portion here is 3,600 meters high. But if you go over to Little Bahama Bank here, you basically go from a reef rimmed margin all the way down to the over 4,000 meter in basically very, very steep slopes and very high slopes. Now, why do we build such steep and high slopes in carbonates? Well, we always said, well, it is on the extended continental margin. We see that, however, that the shapes is not so easy recognized on, on this Bahamian archipelago. And again, here from 10, 000, from 10 meters to 4,600, it goes out there into the deep Atlantic. Also, these carbonate platforms when they sit here on the passive continental margin, they're of course like an obstacle for the currents that flow through here. And in Florida, we have the Florida currents that meets the Antilles currents and then forms the Gulf Stream that goes all the way up through the Atlantic. We have smaller currents or 
branches of currents coming in through the Northwest Providence Channel, through the San Tran Channel up for uniting with the Florida current to make the big Gulf Stream later on. And today I want to show you that these current systems that go around the isolated platform are a very important factor in shaping the, the carbonate platform slopes. So while people have said some of these steep slopes that we have are of course inherited from the rift structure because the Florida Bahamas archipelago is situated on the extended margin of the continental US and it partially is a rift structure underneath and some of the margins go up along the rift structures and just like they do today in the Gulf of Suez, we would have the rift structure, the, in the inclination of the fault and then the planet carbonate platform above it will basically maintain that same slope as it caves away always about the same angle as the rift block was. But we also know that some of the margins actually steep and even stronger or even faster and higher than the rift blocks. And we also have the very steep slopes developing along prograding margin where there is no underlying rift structure. And the reason why we always say that is, is because we have a very early cementation. We basically build brick and brick, we build up the platform and the outer march, outer end of the platform is just cemented up. And it was my, like here in the, Chop Key area, for example, where you go from the Chop Key down into the Northeast Providence Channel. It's one of the steepest phase on Earth. And you see the top 100 meters here are basically a vertical wall. And then it goes down into a slope that is about 70 degrees in inclination and it's cemented. And to the right here, you see that the, the brow on top is still has a living organism, calcareous green algae, sponges, solitary corals. As you go further down on the slope and this vertical wall, we actually have still sponges growing and all this is Holocene. So this is building up and also out. It's accreting outward a little bit. And of course, it's cemented on very early on. Likewise, the slope here, what you see is all cemented. And it was my grammar who in some years back has shown that if you put sediment to it, sediment in 30 meter water depths, and he went down and picked it up with submersible every so often. After 20 months, less than two years, the cements have grown so much that the grain would break and basically you would produce a rock in less than two years. Now, more recently, Mara Diaz has actually shown that microbially mediated cementation can be even faster. And she had done an experiment where samples from Schooner Keys in the Bahamas were taken and then half of the samples were completely sterilized so that no microbial community would be in it. And the other half of the sample was the native or indigenous microbial community was preserved and then put into this little box here and circulated water through both of these samples to look of how much of the inorganic precipitation and occurs in one of them and the other one, or how much actually would happen in this with the microbial community present. And what was surprising was that even after 30 days in the untreated ones, the ooze that had the microbial community in it, you see that the grain grain contact, you had a sort of the EPS going across. We have a lot of bacteria in there and we see a lot of nanograins. We start to fuse the grains together with microbially mediated cements. And you see her very nicely when the EPS retreats, you have the little nanograins that form along here and then they fuse together to form the individual needles that we see behind here or sometimes also the little clusters of nanograins that make these little micropeloidal um, cements between the grains. And so after 60 days, you would have fused grains together, very st strongly fused together, very similar as you would see collected from grapestones in the Uwe Chols and Cholter Key, for example. So here in less than two months, you basically have cemented the grains together. And Jesus Riolit, he went back to the area where Mike Grammer had done his experiments and where he had done his PhD on the slopes here in the southern end of the tongue of the ocean. And they looked at the samples again that they were collected at the time from the slope in different water depths. And what they found is that the slope itself, of course, we knew this from the underwater photography, had sort of this mogul field. It was like bumpy, 
down there and had like quite a bit of microbial communities living on it. And if you take a rock, it was more like a microbialite than it was like just a slope. And on the thin section to the left here, you see a halimida grain that is completely surrounded by microbial coatings and also that the microbialite, this microbial bindings between the grains actually happens in there, very similar to in the micritic cements that we observe in the laboratory. So here, this, the slope here is really clearly microbially strengthened and stabilized with microbially induced cementation, and that can make the slope steep, and the whole process happens very, very fast. So we have all these steep slopes, but the slope architecture actually changes a bit all over the Bahamas. And Wolfgang Schlager at the time, he separated the, the, the slopes in the accretionary, uh, the bypass margin and the erosional escarpment margin. And said, well, in some cases, we actually bypass all the sediment and in all laps on the bottom, other ones migrate out there. And this architecture is generally known, and it actually is also recognized in the ancient. And that was done by Ted Platon, who put this all together. He looked at the different types of these architectures of the slopes around the world, from Italy to the West Australia, and so on, and the, the Carboniferous in Spain, the mud-dominated four slopes. He saw a bit more accretionary and escarpment type margins than the bypass margins. So he also, Ted Platon, summarized sort of all the slope models that we have currently. And when we look here, it's mostly we said, well, carbonates, there is no rivers, there is no channels that cut down from the platform into the slope. So all the grass mass gravity flow deposits then build more an apron along the slopes. And it can be debris dominated, grain dominated, or mud dominated. And so this is basically all these slope models are very much focused on gravity driven sedimentation. And then sometimes we have a bit of a strange facies relationship that doesn't fit so well with the gravity induced um, transport. For example, it is mud dominated when we will come from the platform top over the listified march, we go to the muddy sediments and then to the coarser sediments. And of course, that was always explained by, we have a bypass of the muddy portion and then the coarser turbidite deposit further out into the basin. So the sort of bypass margin. Well, I wanna show you in this talk that some of these relationships can actually probably be explained better by a different mechanism, by the winnowing from the currents. And so let's, Summarize here, look, I want to show you in this talk, go through some of these processes that shape the slopes. Huh? So we already covered the early marine cementation that really helps us build the steep slopes. And then we have everything here that is sort of in um, curves is like the, is the mass gravity flow portions, huh? the rock fall along the escarpments, margin collapse and debris fields, slope failures, headward erosion and slope canyons and turbidity currents that come down through the slopes. And then I want to go to the cascading density currents and the bottom and contour currents that I think play an important role in distributing the slope sediments around the carbonate platforms. So a lot of the data that we now have today where we have a better insight in all these processes come from several expeditions that were done into the Bahamas going back for about 15 to 20 years nearly. The first ones were in the tongue of the ocean from Mike Grammer and then it made big um, changes or big large multi-beam bathymetry data from the group from Thierry Mulder from um, Bordeaux, from um, the Marum in Bremen, and with um, Christian Betzler from Hamburg in through the last years in here in the Straits of Florida and along the Little Bahama Bank. So when we go from the top of the bank out, we currently go out in the bank and it deepens a little bit to 10, 12 meters usually, and then we have this what Mike called the escarpment, a near vertical wall, before we go in a cemented slope that is on lap by uncemented, usually fine-grained sediment. And both the cemented slope and the escarpment are actually Holocene. And what happens here, the escarpment, the, the margin grows quite often out here, and sometimes it breaks out and makes this big talus block, so this rock fall that occurs from the top of the, of the escarpment out onto the steep slope. 
You see this here in a sketch and in underwater photography. And if you look at the windward side of Kaysal Bank, we have here the steep margin of Kaysal Bank here on this side of the of the San Trent Channel. And you see the blocks that sit on the foot of the steep slope. These are the talus blocks from the rockfall that came down from the margin. And then it goes out into the slope that is always dissected by this very regular gullies. You see them here on um, Kaysal Bank, but also all the slopes around on the western margin of Great Bahama Bank. So the similar pattern of the normal gullying of the slope from the currents that come down from the platform top. Don McNeil looked at the distribution of these talus blocks here on Little Bahama Bank, south of it, and he could went along and he classified the discrete blocks, the three to 15 meters or the ones that are over 15 meters. And what he shows was that in generally, every meter, this is, he looked at 28 kilometers of, along the slope, that he had between three and 25 blocks per kilometer. So we see an average about not quite 10 blocks per kilometer. So every 100 meters, a big block will come down. So it's a common feature, a common gravity-driven sedimentation here onto the upper slope from the steep escarpment. Now, the steep margin, of course, we also know can fall out and can break away. And that happens, for example, down here at the southern portion of Great Bahama Bank, close to Cuba. We see more of these scalloped margins closer to Cuba, where we think the reason for that is you have higher seismicity, we have a less stable platform margin. And in this case, you see here the platform retreated quite a bit and all this caved out and made a huge debris field in the channel between the old Bahama channel between Cuba and the Bahamas. This happened a bit before the Holocene because we have a Holocene wedge already onlapping the steep scar here and a little bit of a slope failure within that younger sediment package as well. But when we look at the, at the debris field, it's quite impressive of how much and how far they came out here. So we have the big retreat coming back in here. We have 12 kilometers imaged on this bathymetry data, but the scar actually goes another 12 kilometers of it. Just our data ends here, but it was about over 20 kilometers where the margin collapsed. And then here on the right corner down here, we have a, the slope angle indicated to see some of the larger blocks with very steep angles, but it goes all the way out. So over 20 kilometers again to the end of our data, bathymetry data, the huge debris field that goes out there. And some of the blocks are two kilometers by 800 meters. They're big blocks, sort of what we will call in some cases the Olista list that we find out into the basin away from the platform itself. And as I said before, there is also a ridge here that comes in here, this high ridge that sits halfway up on the margin, came down and didn't quite make it out into the basin. But also we see that we have a later slope failure within that um, margin retreat event. And these are the these slope failures that are in the softer, finer grained sediment. And that is also a feature that is very common on, on all the slopes. All along, we quite often find slope failures that are quite far down, like in this one, 650 meters water depths, and it breaks around of 10 kilometers out here into the basin. And when we look at the size of this, it's quite impressive. So this is over 300 square kilometers of debris that went away from these three slope scars. And we think that all went in once, went out there for several reasons, we think that it went out and the largest blocks out here again are over a kilometer wide and over 50 meters thick. And this actually triggered a tsunami, the, the mass wasting or the mass displacement that happened through that landslide has caused a tsunami that was very nicely modeled and calculated by Yara Schneider some years back where the, the tsunami wave actually would have reached the Florida Reef tract on the other side about, in this case, we think it's sometimes in the early Holocene when this happened, and it was about two to three meter high tsunami wave that hit the Florida Reef Tract at the time. And we still have some scars along, or incipient scars along the margin, and I think it could happen again. One of these days that we would have a submarine slope failure triggered tsunami that would, could hit the Florida coast, maybe tragically high or just as a smaller tsunami. Now, the slope failures 
are one thing. The other thing that we have on the margins, both here to the north of Little Bahama Bank, but also here to the south, are large slope canyons. Very nicely imaged here on this bathymetry data from north of Little Bahama Bank. And I want to zoom in here on these three um, channels or canyons that start here and go out. And you see the, the turbidites that come out to make sort of a overlapping lobes of turbidite deposition in the deeper basin. But how do they actually start? None of them go up onto the platform. So they start downslope and they are produced again by small slope failures. As we discussed here on, on these three um, canyons, where you see that the canyons, you sort of start to break in little pieces of the slope, make a scar and they eat itself either upslope, like in this case here, just a headward erosion up the slope till you don't have enough fine grained sediment anymore to bring the canyon all the way to the platform top. In other cases, they also go sideways. And in this case, they actually reunite two of these amphitheater-like ends of the canyons. And the canyon then, of course, also channels the flow that comes from the platform top down and will bring some sediment and turbidites down into the basin. Well, these are all the, the mass gravity flow deposition that occurs in the margin. But if you look at the margin itself, the undisturbed margin, so the sort of the intact margin somewhere down here on the southern middle portion of the uh, southern Great Bahama Bank, you see you have the steep margin on the side. Here the top is maybe 30, 40 meters steep on this edge here, and then it's the steep margin going down. And you see a little notch here or a little valley or moat all along for 50, 100, 120 kilometers. And always we have a little pool there. There's each one is about 30 to 40 meters deep, about two to 300 meters wide, and they have a crest, and then sometimes another little pool on the other side, and then it goes down into the base. And the slope decreases in declivity out to the lower slope to about two degrees. Now, well, how do we form this? Well, this is from currents that come off the bank and then not only come out and produce what we call a plunge pool, but also make secondary pools and it makes cyclic steps all along the lower slope of Great Bahama Bank here. And the process of that is that you have sediment charged water flow coming from the bank top along the slope where you have a nick point uh, the, like a waterfall coming down, it makes the plunge pool, it goes out and it either flows all the way to the bottom or it goes along a density boundary out into the basin. And when it comes down how these cascading currents, they actually produce this cyclic step as the, you have a hydraulic jump and you go from subcritical deposition to supercritical deposition. And you bring it up here and you pile it up on this side and they start to migrate up the slope, the sediment waves, and we see them here on this um, parasound pictures that it's not just the modern one, but underneath each one of the high stand wedges throughout the Pleistocene has these cyclic steps in it. So it's a process that it repeats itself each time when the platform grows and cascading density currents are shed from the platform top. And the critical point here, Jaros needed to point out that if you go from nine to three degrees, somewhere in here, you go over this critical point, nick point where the slope angle changes and you change to make a hydraulic jump that actually triggers the formation of these cyclic steps. And you can look at on a 3D like this, the currents come from the bank, top discus casing density currents, they come out here, they make the plunge pool, they deposit the sedimentary wedge, and when you have the nick point here, on this position, the change from the, from the flow and you have the subcritical flows and you start to develop all these um, cyclic steps in the, where the change of the slope gradients occur. What you also see out here are these two currents that Yara put here in her, into her schematic scheme. And these are the bottom currents. In this case, quite often uh, we have um, internal tides on the northern portion of Great Bahama Bank, but we also have the whole Florida Straits filled with the current that goes northward here from the Florida current as it goes north and forms the Gulf Stream. And it's the interaction between these 
cascading density currents and the bottom and the ocean currents that actually distributes quite a bit of sediment along the Great Bahama Bank. And when we look at the picture here, we have the warm surface current of the Florida current. We have the Antilles current coming out here and then they form the Gulf Stream as it goes north, it makes a big eddies and eventually sinks down. So here in this, in the nexus, of where the current comes from the Gulf of Mexico, the loop current comes in here, we start to form big drift deposits uh, along the Miami Terrace, the Portales Drift, the Santorin Drift, the Perry Platform Drift here on the, on the side, and the Great Bahama Bank Drift that Hank Mullins described years ago. And these drifts, they're actually three are fed by sediment from the platform top. One of the biggest exporter of fine-grained sediments are hurricane disturbances. So the hurricanes come through and this is for Hurricane Irma in September 2017. It was a monster. You can see that the eye of the hurricane is here, but it covers like the whole Florida, Cuba, the Straits of Andros, every uh, Straits of Florida, everything is covered by the hurricane. And well, after the hurricane passed, the sediment was stirred up on Great Bahama Bank, Quezal Bank, Northern Cuba, on the Florida Bay and on the western shelf of Florida. And it starts to bleed off into the seaways and the currents start to take it to the north. So what we see here on this satellite imagery is just the top portion of, of the current, but a lot of it most likely also did sink down. So what we see, what we see is the finer grained, very fine grained diluted top portion. A lot of it actually went down and goes down all the way to the bottom of the Straits of Florida. So these cascading density currents, they happened when we have sediment brought into the top waters by hurricanes, and then it gets too heavy and the density just they start to flow off. Or we also can have in winter time when we have a cold front coming through, it chills the water on the bank top, it becomes denser than the water in the Straits next to it and it starts to flow off. So these are the two mechanisms, density and um, sediment laden from fine grained particles that they start to flow off. So what happens then is they come off and they start to come off the platform side on this side all the time. They start to, the whole bank will basically continuously several times a year bring fine grained sediment daily with a little bit from the tides, but really the larger portions from this cascading density events onto the slopes. And then the currents will take them along and start to bring them along the slope. And this is a mechanism that we recognized and, and documented some years back. And what you see here is like, when you look at the sediment distribution in this peri-platform wedge, so we come down, we have the plunge pool, and then we have a ridge here. And the ridge, when you take a, a sample there, it's very fine grained peloidal sediment. As you go down here, it actually becomes even finer grained, really muddy. As you go further out across the cyclic steps, only about eight kilometers or so further out, however, the fine grained sediment is gone. And you see, this is the same um, magnification. Out there, we have coarse sediment. So all the fine sediment is basically not present anymore. And it's highly unlikely that the current would just reach down to this position where you still have about two degrees of, of angle. Out here, really the bottom currents, they winnow away the fine grained sediment and leave behind the coarse material here with pteropods, steinkerne, so planktic and benthic forearms. You can see also see it on a larger scale on this uh, data set here, where we see the Bimini will be on this side over here. And here we go into the Straits of Florida and you see the rugged sea floor around here. A lot of um, debris from margin and slope failures up here just north of Bimini. And then this fine grained the smooth slope of the, of the, uh, the Great Bahama Bank slope. Now, when we zoom in here a bit, we also see that this smooth slope actually is from a venue is transported. So we have the, the boulders in, uh, on the slope that came down with the rockfall, and then the, the sediment is transported away. And as we go further out, we have less and less of the fine grained sediment. 
and that has led our had Christian Betzler at the time when, they, when we documented this in, in this cruise, clearly that what we have here is the peri-platform wedge or this high stand wedge that we always describe as occurring around the platform march is indeed in this case on the western side of Great Bahama Bank actually transported along and this is a sort of a plastic drift that we call the peri-platform drift. And depending on how much currents you have for your road higher or is we know higher up the sediment or simply don't let it deposit and bring it into the drifts that are in the middle of the straits where in other cases you can form the beautiful cyclic steps all the way down as it happens in the southern portion of Great Bahama Bank. Well, we have several drifts in the in the Straits of Florida and that the one that I just showed you is the Perry platform drift and we have the, the sand train drift which is a elongated separated drift with a moat on both sides between Kaysal Bank and Great Bahama Bank. We have the large Porto Alas drift and then we have the Great Bahama Bank drift up here that was described by Hank Mullins and it makes sort of the edge of the platform. Well this is again the platform will feed sediment out and then it gets transported and deposited on the edge of the platform. It's and that happens here on Great Bahama Bank, but it also happens up here on Little Bahama Bank, where, it, where the next data set I show you, where Mrs. Shabo has very nicely documented this in an article where it, she looked at the at this drift at the northern edge of Little Bahama Bank, where the Florida currents and Tillis current meet, the sediment is transported there and then deposited. It's a large package again. See, this is 30 kilometers, so this is like 100 kilometers north-south, and the thickness of these drifts in both Little Bahama Bank and Great Bahama Bank is about 800 meters. And it occurs, the starts all about 12 and a half million years ago. So with the onset of the currents, we start to shape the slope and we start to make this platform match drifts. We start to make the peri-platform drift. And of course, we start to make the big channel related drifts like we have in the Santorin channel. This can be summarized in here when you have these complicated patches of platforms and the currents that go through it, the interactions of the sediment that is constantly shed from the platform top into these current systems will actually produce quite a bit of a shaping of the, of the slope and the platform margins. In some cases you could even produce some upwelling, but in physically also you have the contour currents, you make big drifts, you can backstep off the march because you take too much of the sediments away from the with the current and so the margin can steepen and you can make a, a, platform, a drift deposit out there. You have the contour currents going out here that take quite often sediment away from the platform and you can easily envision that over time you actually steepen the platform because you take away material from the slope. When did this all occur? It's very common that this current uh, shaping of the platform margins and the platform slopes started all about the same time with the onset of the modern ocean circulation system that we have. It, in the on Great Bahama Bank, we know it starts about 12 and a half million years ago with the onset of the sand train drift and the margin from then on starts to be from a ramp, starts to build out and become steeper and steeper to the steep margin as we have it today. So clearly here with the, over time, with the current and the restriction from the progradation of the bank, we start to make a steeper and steeper margin. On the Marion platf platform on the Eastern Australian margin, when the onset of the current came, it actually made a big hard ground here, sedimentation completely stopped here on the slope. We made a big contourite drift out on the edge and eventually the drift overlaps or oversteps the platform margin and covers the, the platform underneath. In the Maldives, the same, as a, the same onset about 13 million years ago, where the platform grows out here and then the contourite drift, so the, the, the current starts to come in, the monsoon induced current strengthens, partially drowns the platform, and we had a drift deposition and the steepening of the margin. So everywhere where we look, the neogene is now all over it in the South China Sea, in the, in the Florida Bahamas Peninsula, in Australia, 
is really the current has a major influence on the shape of the slopes and the platforms. And so from then on, we have a current influence on the slopes of, scrape, of the banks. This, I have to say, stress, however, that these ocean currents, they don't make it up on the platform tops, like at least not in the, in the, in the Bahama, Bahamian archipelago, because the frictional forces prevent the current to actually flow on top of it. So they're restricted in the basin, but they shape the slopes of the, of the carbonate platforms. And so just to conclude, I want to say, well, the processes that shape the platform slopes are partially, it's biologically, microbially induced and inorganic cementation of very early and fast um, cementation that stabilizes the steep slopes and make them like building near vertical walls. And then we have all the mass gravity flow that transport the material from the march and the slopes further down basinwards. But from the flat platform tops, we don't have much of mass gravity flows. There we have the cascading density currents that come and take mostly the fine grain material from the platform top into the basin and onto the slope and feed the slope and the current that goes along these carbonate platforms. And so it, the fine grain sediment comes down, goes into the contour and the bottom currents and it is redistributed along the periphery of the platforms to make the these large contrite drifts on the slope itself or on the platform edge. And when we look in the point I want to make here is that when we look at the, the textbooks and all the slope models in, in carbonates really underestimate the, the processes of the currents, especially in all the neogenes, but also in ancient times, we had times where we had increased current activity around the world, like in the Cretaceous in the Testian realm, where we start to really shape the, the slope and the architecture of the platform with the currents. And it unfortunately hasn't made it yet into the textbooks, but you, I think we should all keep in mind that the currents, different types of currents will occur around these platforms that there are an obstacles on the platform, on the continental margin for the currents that all exist there. And with that, I want to finish my talk. Thank you very much. And I think we have some questions and Charles is already here to talk from the chat. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that great talk, Gregor. Um, really interesting stuff. Oh, well, you know, I have a few of my own, but I'll get to the ones in the chat first and sort of wait my turn. Um, so, all right, we have Kate Giles coming from El Paso, Texas. She says, great summary of a lot of excellent work. Do you see any relationship of the contra and bottom currents to sea level changes so that they can be incorporated into the sequence stratigraphy models? So yes, not on a very large scale, but on a, on a, um, on a smaller scale, we know, for example, when the, the sea level drops, we quite often you um, reduce the area between the platforms or at least in the Straits of Florida and what happens is that you actually increase Bernoulli's laws. You have the same amount of water that needs to go through there. You increase the speed of the current a bit and you produce more hard grounds on the upper slopes during times when the sea level is low and the current starts to speed up. And we saw that in the course from, um, that were drilled on in borehole Kleino that we actually had um, the upper slope on the sequence boundaries was quite often a hard ground because the current really took everything away. The same thing happened in the um, in East Australia, Lake 194. The sequence boundaries there are quite often on the slope, on the upper slope to mid slope, are hard grounds before further out in the basin we see less of this effect. So, this the, in a sequence stratigraphic picture or on on logs or whatever, you would see this the hard grounds as a very characteristic feature for the, uh, overprinting the sequence boundaries. But the platform top will be the exposure and the slope will be the hard ground or the firm ground, reduced sedimentation. Okay, that makes sense. I'll sort of piggyback off of that question. And so if you see um, those increased strengths of the currents, do you then see a corresponding um, larger drift deposit associated with sea level falls? So, that hard, harder to say, maybe? <laughs> um, not, no, actually not, because what happens is what we see in the drift, uh, in the drift, quite often we see um, an, a bit an increase of clay 
material, and that is like in the Florida Bahamas region is when the sea level drops, we have uh, and it starts to come up again. We have the ravine and erosion in Cuba, Hispaniola, and we saw the clay material coming and still see classic material coming, but because during the um, sea level lowering, we actually reduce the platform top production or turning completely off. So we have reduced sedimentation or input into the current. And we have more far field input from clay material that we see. And so we have, we produce in the Bahamas on the, in the sand terrain drift, it basically develops a clay marl, a marl limestone alternation. And I suspect that many more limestone alternation in the ancient are these high frequency sea level changes where we reduce the carbonate production a bit or input and they have a bit more of the silicy classic and so we have in a precession or even or an orbitally forced cyclicity, we have this alternation of more or less carbonates and by that we produce more or less more on limestone alternations. Okay. Hmm. Okay, our next question is from uh, Mariano. He's coming from Fairfax, Virginia. He says, hi, Gregor, thanks for this great presentation. Can you estimate the volume of carbonate mud redistributed by currents? Also, how far um, the mud carbonate is transported by these currents? So the, it's, um, we have a student who is in process to calculating the exact volume. So, uh, but I just want to say these are huge volumes and actually go quite a bit. So the um, the Portales Drift is over 180 kilometers long, is like over 50 kilometers wide, and is over 800 meters thick. And the platform that feeds that is basically from the West Florida Shelf, the Miami and Portales Terrace, and it comes up there and it's transported along. So it's, I would say it's like 100, 150 kilometers, something like that. Also the, the platform edge drift, they're over hundred kilometers in distance. So at least that distance it goes. And again, they're very, very thick. So it's a, it's a huge volume. And I would say that most of the sediment that we find, the fine grain is all transported a bit. How far? Well, quite a bit. So the huge, I mean, like the, the Portales Drift, I said, coming from Switzerland, it would fill the whole Switzerland the, from the Alps all the way to southern Germany, you could fill with the Portales Drift. It's, it's a huge volume. So we're working on the numbers, it sounds like, but huge and far. <laughs> yes, huge, yes. It's a, it's a phenomenal amount. I mean, like all the drift deposits, the big drifts in the, the Atlantic, you know, the Irish drift is a huge, this is some of the largest sedimentary bodies that is transported. Okay, great. Um, so we'll get on to our next question from Axel Munica, coming from Erlangen. Hi, Axel. It's a fantastic talk. My question is, cementation is often microbially mediated, but how does it work if microbes are not sort of responsible? Um, which processes lithify the sediment in this case? Well, you can, you can, of course, have um, inorganic precipitation out of the water column. The, the, the seawater is supersaturated in regards to calcium carbonate. So it could just precipitate in itself. And quite often what we see is like you have an immediate binding or stabilization of the grains by microbial binding, sometimes with or without semen, micro, microtic cementation, and then the then the prismatic cements start to grow on top of it and actually cement it like that. So in the, in the experiment that Mike Rammer did where he took the sediment samples that didn't have much microbes in it, after two years he had enough inorganic precipitation of fascicular arachnoid that we made the rock out of it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a sort of, I think they, the microbial binding at the beginning helps to speed up the process, but later on you can have inorganic precipitation. Sort of dominate in there. Okay. Um, if anybody else has any questions, please type those into the chat. Um, in sort of the downtime, I will get to one of my questions. Um, building off of Axel's question, I was wondering if uh, anyone has looked at it. I know that you touched on that study by Mara, where she was looking at the um, microbial precipitation along the slope. I'm wondering if she or anybody else has looked at if there are changes in sort of the microbial community along the slope. So are there sort of larger scale um, changes in the, the biogeochemical cycling there? 
nobody has done a DNA analysis on the different positions on the slope. No, that has not been done yet. Okay. So also I have to say this experiment that Mara did was from sediments from the platform top. Uh -huh. So, it, so okay. it oh, what would come down onto the slope, you collect it there and look at what happens to it there. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting. Maybe something I uh, need to email with Mara about. <laughs> um, okay, so we have um, one from Jia Jia from China. He says, um, hi, Gregor. Thank you very much for the great talk. My question is, how do channels form on the slope from uh, on the slope of drowned carbonate platforms? Well, I think the channels form while the platform is still growing. Not once, the, yeah, while they can drown, but it's like it's always headward erosion. I don't, there's never ever a channel documented that goes all the way up to the platform top. They always start in the fine grained soft sediment that onlaps the cemented uppermost slope. And so it's like out on the, on the continental rise and all that, where you see that the, the bit of the slope breaks away and then it eats itself up and it eats as headward erosion upwards and, and, and it makes this erosional pattern. It can happen as long as the platform and the drown platform, as long as the slope is not cemented, it, it can happen while the platform is not is drowning or already drowned. Mm -hmm. But quite often it actually happens by over steepening of material that comes to the slope that triggers the small scale failure. And so I would say that more likely the, the channels already form while the platform was still growing before it drowned. Mm -hmm. okay. That would be my, my hypothesis, but yeah. Yes, best guess. All right. Um, okay, so I had one more for you. I was wondering sort of how stable the drift deposits are. So, of course, you touched a lot on how um, the stability of the slope can yeah, yeah, be sort of connected to those, those different um, deposits that you have along the slope. But in terms of the drift, when do those start to um, cement and stabilize? Or are they, for a lot of um, their time, are they sort of potentially mobile? Well, it depends a bit which drift. So the, the Sandran drift in the middle, where the, which Lexis 166 drilled the core right down smack in the middle. And um, so the top portion was completely fine grained and uncemented. You could go down it, all into the Miocene before you really started to see the mm -hmm. cementation. And when the cementation came in, it was quite uniform cementation all the way down and it became very nicely cemented and, um, and the recovery core recovery increased quite a bit and was nice to drill a core throughout the whole package. On the slope, um, it's a bit different. There you have quite often, like when you have the decrease of the sedimentation rates during the low stands, you make a cemented portion. And this cemented package, when you drill, it was the same here in the Bahamas, like in the, like on the, Marion platforms you drill with and you basically have like very hard drilling and then it becomes soft again hard and soft again so and then this actually makes an unstable slope you know that many of the slope failures along western great bahama bank when we see on the seismic it breaks down to one of these better cemented slopes and um, a couple people have dated those and they can clearly show that each sea level glacial maximum during the Pleistocene has produced a cemented layer on the slope. Mm -hmm. So there the sedimentation de rate decrease promoted uh, hardening of the slope. Sure. And so by doing that then you have like, yeah, it's like the avalanches in the Alps, you know, you have powder snow and then it freezes, gets a bit warmer. You make a hard layer, the next one top. And these are always the, the unstable layers where you can where it slips away. Mm -hmm. they, they are pretty unstable, actually. Yeah, OK. Um, all right, we just have a, one last comment from Teresa from Erlangen. She says, thanks for the great presentation. Um, sort of more of a comment, just that there's a nice study on the microbial community changes by ORC um, in 2009. So if anybody's interested, there's a link there. Um, OK, so it, since we don't have any more questions in the chat, Gregor, thank you again for this wonderful presentation. We really appreciate you coming to uh, SEDS online and giving today's webinar. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It was of course, of course. Very nice. I think it's a wonderful series, and I see that a lot of good um, speakers are lined up for the future, and I hope everybody will join them next time. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. If um, 
if uh, any of you are, are interested, you're always welcome to reach out if you have some suggestions. Uh, all right, so don't forget to join us next Wednesday where we will have our next SEDS Online webinar. And Chris Perry is going to be talking about reef carbonate. So all of my carbonate people come back out and uh, see what it's all about. And um, yeah, have a great rest of your week and we will see you then.